In New York in the 1980s, the emergence of crack cocaine brought a new wave of violence. Drug dealers robbed and killed as they scrambled for power. Ordinary citizens were victimized. Even children were not immune. The FBI joined forces with the New York City police to take back the streets. Their best weapon against deadly drug gangs was the C-11 squad. New York City is no stranger to gang violence. But when a 12-year-old child was kidnapped, the gangs had crossed the line. Law enforcement raced to find the missing boy before it was too late. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Agents would have to infiltrate the secretive world of a vicious gang to stop the murderous exploits of a drug lord. In the 1980s, crack cocaine invaded the Harlem section of New York, as it did many urban areas in America. Over time, the cheap and highly addictive drug crippled communities unlike any other drug had before. With the crack came ruthlessly violent gangs that ruled the streets. No one was truly safe. On December 5, 1989, 12-year-old Donnell Porter was walking to elementary school alone. He never made it to class that day. When he didn't arrive home after school, his family worried. They hadn't been able to find him in the neighborhood. At 9 p.m., Donnell's sister received a phone call. Yeah. A man on the other end said Donnell had been kidnapped. He wanted $500,000 or the boy would be killed. The sister said the family didn't have that kind of money. It didn't matter to yeah. the caller. Yeah. He warned them not to contact police, then instructed them to go to a restaurant at 125th and Broadway. Behind a trash can in the restroom, they'd find something that would prove he was serious. A family friend went to the restaurant so the porters could stay by the phone. He didn't know if it was a setup. Following the kidnapper's orders, he checked behind the trash container and found a coffee can. Inside were two rings, an audio cassette, and a child's severed finger. Donnell was hurt and could be bleeding to death. Despite being warned not to, the family called the New York City police. Following you, looking at you. The family told investigators what they knew. Detectives inspected the evidence. The sister said that the rings belonged to Donnell. They'd been given to the boy by his older brother. On the tape, a recorded plea for help was definitely Donnell's voice. The family told detectives about a second call in which the kidnapper had lowered his ransom to $350,000. It was still far beyond their means. 
They said they didn't know why they were targeted for such a high ransom. But detectives knew what the family wouldn't say. The victim's older brother, Richard Porter, was a major crack cocaine dealer in the area. Police believe the kidnapping was related to his drug empire. NYPD contacted the New York FBI's reactive squad for assistance. Special Agent David Higgins, a narcotics expert, was asked to provide more intelligence on Richard Porter. Anything they have, any of them. Richard Porter, then about 25 years of age, uh, was a well-known crack dealer uh, whose activities uh, took place in central Harlem. Uh, he was one of those individuals who got in early on the crack trade in New York, and he had created uh, a significant drug empire in central Harlem. Richard Porter had made millions of dollars selling crack on New York's streets. Detectives knew where his turf was. What's going on, man? It didn't take long to find Porter. Detectives recognized the person he was with as his drug running partner, Alpo Martin. This visit wasn't about drugs, it was about finding Donnell. Porter agreed to come to the station for an interview, though he said he didn't know how he could help. Look, guys, I don't know anything. Police knew Porter was very close to Donnell, but he claimed to know nothing about who was behind his brother's kidnapping. On the streets, these matters are usually solved without the cops. Though Porter most likely held the key to finding Donnell, he was in no position to talk to authorities. Richard Porter, uh, because of his situation as a drug trafficker, uh, found himself in a ticklish situation legally. Uh, it would have been difficult for him to cooperate directly with law enforcement. I believe he attempted to handle this situation uh, on his own to some extent. Police had nothing to hold him on. Authorities needed to find someone else to help them. They canvassed the area, trying to gather information on the kidnapping. In such a close-knit neighborhood, someone had to have heard something about Donnell. But residents were too afraid to talk. Harlem's violent gangs had a stranglehold on the community. Detectives were left with nothing. With each passing day, police in NYPD's 32nd Precinct knew Donnell's chance of survival decreased. Investigators maintained contact with the boy's family, who were desperate for more word from the kidnappers. A week after the abduction, the family received a note. In it, the kidnappers hinted Donnell was still alive. They demanded their money. But no more ransom calls came. With no clues to the boy's whereabouts and no one talking, police had reached a dead end. They somehow needed to pressure Richard Porter into cooperating, or hope he would pay the ransom to get Donnell back. Then, on January 4th, 1990, a month after Donnell's abduction, the body of his brother, drug kingpin Richard Porter, was found in a Bronx park. He had been shot twice, in the head and chest. There would be no one to pay the ransom now. It was widely assumed that, that Richard's death was connected to uh, the kidnapping and probably the result of a ransom payment gone bad. However, it was noted early on that uh, when his body was discovered, uh, his wallet contained over $2,000 in U.S. currency. Uh, his jewelry was there. Uh, apparently, his automobile was nearby. 
so there was some question about what the actual motivations uh, were behind his murder. With Richard Porter's death, investigators lost their closest connection to the abducted 12-year-old. To find another source, they increased pressure on lower-level dealers in Porter's organization. Facing drug charges, they were offered leniency in exchange for information. Some said Porter's partner, Alpo Martinez, could be involved. Others claimed an infamous Harlem gang called the Preacher Crew might be. But none offered direct leads to the crime. Three weeks later, a boy's body was recovered in the same Bronx Park where Richard Porter was found. His family identified the body of Donnell Porter. Cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. A death of a child is always a disturbing event. Um, there's a 12-year-old boy, he's on the way to public school. He's kidnapped, uh, tortured. Uh, he's heard uh, on the tape cassette uh, uh, crying for help from his family. Donnell's murder stunned the entire Harlem community, even though violence was a daily occurrence there. At the time, Sergeant James Marr worked NYPD's notorious 32nd Precinct, where Donnell lived. In the late 80s and the early 90s, the 32nd Precinct, which is actually geographically only one square mile, was one of the most violent precincts in New York City. Um, they averaged in the area of the upper 60s to low 70s of uh, homicides a year, and added on to that were shootings, several hundred shootings, that the people didn't die. In response to the increased violence in the city, a task force called the C-11 Squad had been formed at the FBI's New York field office. Detectives from the 32nd Precinct and FBI agents were assigned to the squad. C-11 was created to address these entrenched criminal conspiracy groups in the city of New York. The locals brought their knowledge of the streets, uh, the knowledge of the subjects involved, to the table. Uh, the federal agents brought along uh, with them the access to the federal courts, um, which included the access to the federal sentencing guidelines in the United States Attorney's Office. After the murder of Donnell Porter, they knew they had to take back the streets. C-11 would first go after Alpo Martinez, Richard Porter's partner. The problem is here, we haven't if their partnership the had unraveled, he would have had the most to gain from extorting Richard Porter and killing him. Still working on some surveillance. A year earlier, a warrant had been sworn out for his arrest on drug charges. But when Martinez couldn't be found, federal prosecutors had to drop the warrant. In police computers, the C-11 squad flagged the names of known associates of Alpo Martinez. If any were arrested, they would be notified. Months later, police in Washington, D.C. pulled over a car after observing its driver engage in a drug deal. The driver was a known courier for Alpo Martinez. Police found a large amount of crack and thousands of dollars in his car. Noting the flag on his record from New York, D.C. authorities would contact the C-11 squad. After the courier was sentenced to 20 years to life on drug charges, C-11 agents had him transported to New York for an interview. I want some information because we want... An agent explained that under federal law, his sentence could be reviewed if he cooperated with authorities. You're just making this difficult. Where does he, all I know he told what he knew about Martinez and Porter's East Coast drug operation. Drugs would be distributed both in New York City by Richard Porter and in Washington, D.C. by Alpo Martinez. While in Washington, D.C., Martinez allied himself 
with individuals that he uh, found to be strong on the street, if you will, in order to protect his drug operation in Washington, D.C. And it was not unusual for literally sea bags worth of U.S. currency to be shipped out of Northern Virginia and Washington, D.C. up into uh, the Porter neighborhood at 132nd and 7th uh, Avenue in New York City. It was enough for a renewed arrest warrant on Alpo Martinez. Agents canvassed the neighborhood, talking to people who knew Martinez. Most were afraid to talk. Eventually, agents learned the fugitive was going to pick up his wife's car at a dealership in northern New Jersey. Undercover agents staked out the dealership. They didn't know if Martinez would show up, but they knew he liked fast cars. That afternoon, a sports car pulled up. They watched a passenger get out, but it wasn't Martinez. Agents couldn't tell if the fugitive was driving. They had to risk a closer look. If they could arrest Martinez, it might help solve the murders of Richard Porter and his 12-year-old brother, Donnell. An agent visually identified Martinez as the driver. He radioed a go-ahead signal. But before the arrest team could respond, Martinez spun away. Agents gave chase, but the fugitive disappeared into heavy traffic. With Alpo Martinez still a fugitive, the abduction and murder of 12-year-old Donnell Porter remained unsolved. The abduction and murder of 12-year-old Donnell Porter showed that Harlem's drug violence was out of control. The FBI's C-11 squad knew the murder was connected to the boy's brother, crack dealer Richard Porter. But Porter himself had been killed. C-11 believed finding Porter's partner, Alpo Martinez, would provide answers. But in 1991, Martinez had eluded an FBI undercover operation. From the incident, the FBI got his license plate number and alerted New York police to be on the lookout for the vehicle. The next day, police spotted it, parked on a Harlem street. They impounded it, hoping it might lead to Martinez. They believed the fugitive wouldn't retrieve the vehicle himself, but FBI Special Agent David Higgins waited to see if he'd send someone. A young lady showed up who claimed to be the true owner. She was the registered owner. Um, ultimately, a quick investigation established that uh, she was uh, what we call a straw man or somebody who had stepped forward in order to buy and register the car on behalf of uh, Mr. Martinez. Martinez was nowhere to be found in New York. Acting on a tip that he had traveled to Washington, D.C., agents set up surveillance at the D.C. home of the fugitive's ex-wife. In the early hours of November 7, 1991, they spotted Martinez getting into his ex-wife's vehicle. This time, he wasn't driving. As they pulled out, the FBI made their move. the fugitive's ex-wife pulled over. The cocaine in his possession helped cement the case against one of the biggest drug traffickers on the East Coast. Ultimately, uh, Mr. Martinez pled guilty to an indictment in the Eastern District of Virginia which accused him of trafficking in over a thousand kilograms of cocaine. Uh, the wholesale value of that would be uh, $20 million. Partner, Richie Rich, who killed him. 
Investigators also had evidence against Martinez on several gangland murders. They told him they knew he was Richard Porter's partner, so he stood to gain from Donnell's and Richard's death. Hoping to avoid the death penalty, Alpo Martinez agreed to cooperate. He admitted killing his partner, Richard Porter. Martinez had begun to suspect his partner had been cheating him out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. He said that more than a year earlier, on January 4th, 1990, he and an associate had taken Richard Porter for a ride. Almost immediately, Martinez and the associate each shot him. They dumped his body in the Bronx Park where it was found the next day. Martinez swore it was just about missing drug money. It had nothing to do with Donnell Porter's kidnapping and murder. No evidence or testimony linked Martinez to that crime. He went to prison for life. Although they had put away a major drug dealer, the local and federal investigators of the C-11 squad were no closer to solving the murder of Donnell Porter. They reviewed FBI intelligence already gathered on other Harlem gangsters who might have profited from extorting and killing Richard Porter. One gang stood out as likely suspects. They were known as the Preacher Crew. The gang's leader was Clarence Preacher Heatley. FBI Special Agent Joe Walsh, formerly of the C-11 squad, knew the preacher and his crew were well entrenched and very dangerous. Preacher crew was the established crew in the neighborhood, uh, you know, for a long time. Uh, preacher had been kicking around the streets of Harlem since the early 70s, and uh, everybody knew him by his nickname, the Black Hand of Death, and everybody was deathly afraid of him. NYPD Sergeant James Marr of the C-11 squad learned the preacher had a reputation for violence but the gangster was an elusive figure in Harlem. You could walk up to anybody in the 32nd precinct, no matter how church-going they are, no matter whether they're businessmen or local drug dealers, they all have a preacher story. They all know who preacher is. Ask any of them to describe preacher to you, or a majority of them, they're not gonna be able to. Because this guy was an infamous legend in Harlem. The players in Harlem's drug underworld had carved up the area into zones. Each block, each alley, was the established turf of a single dealer. Most dealers respected the boundaries. But the preacher did not. He considered all of Harlem his turf. He made his money not by dealing drugs, but by taxing other dealers. But he was mostly into extortion, extorting drug dealers. These are guys that were violent in their own, in their own right. He would go up and claim their car. If a drug dealer looked like he was getting paid, so to say, he was driving a brand new full-size Mercedes-Benz, and Preacher liked that car, that was Preacher's. Those who argued with Preacher paid a heavy price. It was a system that made him a rich man. If you're hitting every other drug dealer on the streets, you know, 2,000 here, 3,000 here, 5,000 there, that's a lot of money, it adds up. And believe me, they all paid, because if they didn't pay, Preacher would pay him a visit, or he would order his people to pay him a visit, and they'd wind up dead. The preacher's history of extortion and violence made him a likely suspect in the abduction and murder of Donnell Porter. C-11 had outlined the basic structure of the preacher crew. The preacher's main lieutenant was a man named John Cuff. 
He was a particularly dangerous criminal, according to C-11's detective Vinnie Flynn. John Cuff was an ex-New York City housing cop. As a cop, uh, he provided uh, protection and bodyguard work for a preacher. Um, so if they were driving through the neighborhood and were stopped, uh, John Cuff had a shield where he would probably be uh, let go and not given a summons or, or anything further would happen. Um, John Cuff had a reputation of one to be feared, a uh, very violent person. Yet no evidence linked either man to Donnell Cuff. Porter. Because Though C-11 suspected Preacher was involved in the deadly kidnapping, he probably didn't commit it himself. He distanced himself from most of the crimes, having his main lieutenant and other henchmen carry out his orders. At Preacher's command, their brutal extortion tactics earned them money and kept witnesses too intimidated to talk, effectively insulating the crew against investigation. We go into a, you know, a bodega or a, you know, someplace up in Holland, and we'd say, we know he came in here, and the guy would have a cast on his hand, we know he broke your hand. And, and, the, and the shop owner would say, I don't know what you're talking about. You know? And that, that shop owner would be paying rent you know, or tax to, to preach it. But nobody would tell us anything. With people too afraid to talk, crimes continued to pile up. On New Year's Eve, 1992, emergency units responded to a call in the preacher's territory. A man lay dead in his car, the victim of a drive-by shooting. His family survived the harrowing ordeal. They described how the killers pulled up next to them on the street and opened fire. They claimed they didn't know who did it or why. And like Danelle's kidnapping, no one in the neighborhood admitted seeing anything. It was another tragic killing in Harlem that might go unsolved. The C-11 squad had to breach the area's violently enforced code of silence and finally get insiders to talk. A shocking drive-by shooting was added to the list of unsolved murders in Harlem. With witnesses too afraid to cooperate with police, the case was open for two years. Then in 1994, the C-11 squad found a witness who told them the shooter was a preacher crew member named Malik. Detective Vinnie Flynn learned that Malik had a violent reputation. Uh, he became a so-called director of security for the preacher organization. Uh, he was in charge of the group of members who were known as the janitors. The janitors were the people that had to clean up the problems or the mess of the family and you couldn't be a janitor unless you killed somebody. To get more on Malik and the preacher crew, C-11 tried to send in undercover officers. It was yet another dead end, according to FBI Special Agent Joe Walsh. We weren't able to uh, really get in, so to speak, and get an undercover in there to buy uh, narcotics from Preacher, because Preacher was very, very careful. He was, you know, he's a very smart man, and we couldn't get the the, uh, the undercover, you know, close to him. The preacher had closed ranks, ordering the people he extorted not to sell to new buyers and to keep a low profile on the street. Investigators needed a witness with close ties to the crew. He distributed business cards, hoping one would find its way to an insider willing to talk. Their persistence paid off. 
In April 1994, a crew member contacted the C-11 squad because he realized his life was in danger. He said the preacher had started going after his own crew members. Preacher had killed two of the informant's partners. Fearing he was next, he asked Sergeant James Marr for protection. Who was a stone cold killer himself, who became an informant that was so fearful of Preacher and of being killed like his partners had, that he came to me that he came to us, that he gave us information on specific crimes, that he talked about crimes that had been unsolved for years. Investigators were frustrated that the informant knew nothing of 12-year-old Donnell Porter's kidnapping and murder. But he did give investigators their first specific insider information about Preacher Heatley's organization. He mentioned a killing basement that the crew used as a meeting place and execution chamber. At some meetings, Preacher would call for a vote on the fate of gang members who had fallen out of favor. If the majority voted thumbs down, Preacher ordered a murder. In March 1994, Preacher called for a vote on Malik, the janitor who had done the drive-by shooting. He believed Malik could no longer be trusted. The vote was thumbs down. Preacher summoned Malik to headquarters. Malik thought he was there to take part in the beating of a crew member that he had had problems with in the past. Not realizing he was the real target, Malik was excited when others invited him to the basement. If you went down there and you were followed in there, you know, somebody was behind you, you weren't coming on alive. Preacher told Malik he had to die. He was gaining too much influence within the organization. Preacher wouldn't tolerate it. Malik pleaded for his life. But the order had been given. At Preacher's command, other janitors used a circular saw to dismember Malik. The informant said that Preacher ordered him and another crew member to dispose of the body parts. They poured acid on Malik's arms to remove gang tattoos that could link him to the crew. Then they left the body parts in several crumbling, abandoned buildings. They uh, kept Malik's head in a, um, in a refrigerator for a couple of weeks, uh, and they kind of paraded it around on a stick. You know, that's how Preacher would, you know, uh, keep the fear of, uh, fear of God, so to speak, in, in the, uh, in the younger, younger Turks in his organization. The fear was too much for the informant, though he knew leaving the crew was equivalent to a death sentence. He hoped the C-11 squad could protect him. It didn't take long for word to get back to the preacher that the informant had cooperated. One day, the informant was leaving a New York courthouse when he spotted Preacher and Cuff. He was sure they were there to abduct and kill him. He went to his car and called his C-11 handlers. The informant advised me that his fear that he was going to be killed by the organization, he was going to be abducted right in the middle of the afternoon in front of the courthouse. 
the agents of C-11 rush to stop another murder in the preacher's territory. I'm scared to death. A former member of the preacher crew feared the gang was out to kill him for cooperating with authorities. Get out of the car! Out of the car. Out of the car. Agents and detectives from the FBI C-11 squad came to his aid just in time. They arrested Maine Lieutenant John Cuff and the crew leader himself, Clarence Preacher Heatley. Sergeant James Marr and the other arresting agents searched the vehicle. There was evidence inside, including information about my informant, masks, tape. It was apparent at the time that my informant's um, feelings were right. He was going to be abducted that day. But no one could prove that the men were coming to kill the informant. 20 minutes, all it took. The preacher and Cuff were released. The incident brought the C-11 squad's investigation of the crew into the open. That's when it became apparent that they were being investigated by the FBI. I mean, here's this detective that they know from the 3-2, that when he does make an arrest, makes arrests with FBI agents. It became apparent to Cuff and Preacher that the FBI was breathing down their neck. Preacher further insulated himself. The FBI would have to get him by going after his organization. Prosecute, they would use federal racketeering statutes known as RICO. Originally designed to bring down organized crime families, RICO requires that strict criteria are met, according to FBI Special Agent Joe Walsh. You have to have your organization, you have to have your leader, which in this case was Preacher, and he has to have five or more people working underneath him, you know, to facilitate uh, the conspiracy of the organization. But you also need three. Um, predicate offenses, three federal offenses. The C-11 investigators surveilled the Preacher crew, gathering evidence on offenses to support the RICO case. They noticed unrest within the gang. It seemed the pressure of C-11's investigation was getting to the Preacher. From an informant, agents learned he even ordered the murder of his main lieutenant, John Cuff. Agents were obligated to warn Cuff of the hit. John Cuff! I reached for my shield, he goes, I know who you are, you don't have to show me your shield. I said, you know, John, I just wanted to let you know that uh, there's a contract out in your life, and I swear there's nothing but space when you look in his eyes. And he goes, everybody wants me dead. Come on, man. Coming in, man. Come on, man. Cuff was undaunted by the threat. Though the preacher was tightening his grip on his men, investigators still needed to get evidence of the crimes the crew committed to support the racketeering organization. As more buyers and sellers were arrested, some agreed to cooperate, helping to outline the group in detail, according to Detective Vinnie Flynn. We obtained the informants through uh, narcotics investigations, arrests made by uh, the 3-2 precinct and the 3-2 detective squad, uh, through information they developed and informants they developed. Um, because of arrest, uh, information was uh, compiled, which built a case against uh, the preacher crew. What murders do you know about? Unfortunately, no one had information on the Donnell Porter murder. There was this girl who went to the park. But one arrested crew member offered details of another murder committed by the crew, hoping for leniency. He said they decided they didn't want to pay for a shipment of drugs. They told the supplier that a young woman had stolen them and that they would take care of her.
She was a single mother who sometimes worked as a courier for the crew. Did you see the They brought her to a Harlem apartment, telling her they wanted her to hear a record they had produced. Look it up, look it up. She hadn't stolen any drugs. That didn't matter to the crew. The informant explained how they cleaned up the crime scene, then dumped the body in an abandoned building. He couldn't remember exactly which building it was. In August 1996, after more than five years of meticulous investigation, the U.S. Attorney's Office of the Southern District of New York decided they had enough for indictments and arrests on federal RICO charges. The first indictment was against Clarence Preacher Heatley and John Cuff. The indictment was kept sealed. If word got out to the preacher, he might disappear forever. Investigators staked out Preacher's Harlem headquarters. They hoped news of the indictments hadn't been leaked, and that if they found him, they could arrest him without a fight. They knew Preacher was surrounded by armed men, willing to kill at his command. In late 1996, the C-11 squad was ready to arrest Clarence Preacher Heatley. No one had seen him in days. On August 12th, he emerged from his headquarters building. Detectives made sure he was alone, then moved in. Preacher, drop the phone, drop the phone. Drop the phone, let me see your hands. Get on the car, get on the car. Get on the car, let me see your hands. Get on the car, get on the car. Get on the car. Get on the car. As he was arrested, the elusive gang leader remained relaxed and confident. As soon as he was in custody, other teams arrested his main lieutenant, John Cuff. Two months later, 15 more Preacher crew members were indicted. The rest teams prepared for simultaneous takedown. They had to strike fast, full force, to arrest gang members safely. Detective Vinnie Flynn and other C-11 investigators developed more cooperating witnesses among the arrested crew members. Once people were arrested and being prosecuted, they agreed to cooperate, and they uh, felt that they were used by the preacher crew and felt that if, in some cases if they didn't uh, participate, they would have been killed too. So this was um, their way out uh, of the preacher crew and from under uh, Clarence Heatley's uh, control. Investigators learned in which Harlem buildings the crew dumped some of their victims. Finding physical evidence was crucial in order to prosecute the Rico case. One building was a shell, partially collapsed on the inside, further complicating the retrieval. After days of excavating tons of rubble, a body was discovered. Lab examiners determined it was the body of the young mother who had been killed as a cover for stolen drugs. She had been shot in an apartment in an adjacent building. Evidence response teams checked the apartment. That's the apartment where they kept the Malik's head. And in the refrigerator, uh, there was a lot of blood still left in the apartment. And inside the refrigerator, there was Malik's blood from when they, where they, where they, where they you know, kept his head. They were able to uh, trace that at the lab. Malik and several others had been killed in the basement of the preacher's headquarters. Crime scene technicians processed the basement. 
Arrested crew members said Preacher had them scrub the place with boric acid after each killing. Most of the basement was clean. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there you go. But technicians were able to recover traces of blood on the windows and on the saw blade that had been used to dismember Malik. But the investigation was not over. The abduction and murder of young Donnell Porter was still unsolved. Good morning, gentlemen. Have a seat. Answers about his death finally came from an unlikely source. An assistant district getting. attorney convinced the boy's How's uncle, How's preacher crew back? member John yeah, Apple Porter, drive. to come in to talk. He was one of the crew's main players left on the street and had been labeled a snitch. Two attempts had been made on his life. The DA suggested that Porter cooperate to earn protection in prison. He confessed to several murders and revealed what happened to his nephew, Donnell. According to Sergeant James Marr, the kidnapping was prompted by jealousy and greed. The underlying factor with Johnny Porter, Johnny Apples, with the kidnapping was when he came home from prison, Richie Porter, his nephew, was this big Harlem drug dealer. He was getting paid. Richie Porter used to wear a lot of gold, used to really like flashy cars. He was making a lot of money, and he wasn't giving any to Johnny Porter. And Johnny Porter felt he was owed this, and he decided to take it. And the way he, was, he took it is he snatched the kid. Porter said the preacher agreed to the kidnapping. He sent one of his janitors, Malik, to help. They believed Richard Porter would pay anything to get his brother back. No. They kept the boy in a basement where no one would hear him. What's up, Sean? Go make a take for They cut off his finger and recorded the boy's pleas for help to prove to his family they were serious. Apple and Preacher hoped for $500,000, enough to set Apple up in his own drug trade and enough to cripple Richard Porter. When Richard couldn't come up with that amount of cash, they lowered it to $350,000. Then the unexpected happened. Preacher and Apple learned that Richard Porter was murdered. There'd be no ransom. You sure about that? Make the call. Preacher Heatley later told Special Agent Joe Walsh about his decision. Our preacher sat right down in a room and uh, and told me exactly what happened. Um, you know, uh, he looked me right in the eye and said, "You know, I couldn't let that boy live after uh, after what had happened." Yeah. John Porter insisted that it was Malik who actually Yo, did the killing. Malik was later killed and dismembered at the preacher's command. John Porter was sentenced to natural life. Because of the evidence collected by the C-11 squad, each member of the preacher crew went to prison. Their leader, Clarence Preacher Heatley, pled guilty to federal racketeering charges that included drug trafficking, assault, and murder. He was sentenced to life with no chance of parole. He and his crew will never again terrorize the streets of Harlem. It's estimated that they're responsible for approximately 45 murders that we're aware of. Numerous robberies, if you add the extortion in, these people were, were a decade long or better crime wave in themselves. They were, they were just amazing, the devastation that they caused in these communities. That changed when the C-11 squad dismantled the preacher crew forever. Since the case was closed, Harlem has seen a rebirth. Harlem today, the 32nd precinct, is running somewhere between 15 and 20 homicides a year, down from the 70s.
down from 70 a year in the late 80s during the crack cocaine binge. I think we accomplished quite a bit with this, drug, this case. And the drug organization doesn't exist anymore, so we can't hurt anybody else. Robbery. Torture. Murder. A drug cartel will do anything to protect their business, no matter who's caught in the crossfire. The FBI and NYPD worked together to fight back, risking their own lives by going undercover to unlock the secrets of deadly drug gangs, to bring them down from the inside. When the streets of New York flooded with crack cocaine in the 1980s, a wave of violence threatened to drown the city. Colombian cartels brought the coke in and ran their operations with an iron fist. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Agents somehow had to infiltrate a complex crime ring, protected by a code of silence. Going head to head with killers, any misstep would be fatal. Crack cocaine, cheap, easy to make, and highly addictive. When it hits the streets, violent crime follows. Most of the bloodshed occurs at the street level, among users and dealers. But innocent people suffer too. NYPD detective Richard Eppolito worked narcotics. This one gentleman that owned a uh, Chinese restaurant came out one night and there was a couple of uh, individuals involved in drugs and they'll do anything they can to do to get their next fix. Well, this particular gentleman had gold teeth and they thought nothing to kill him. They just shot him dead and while he's down on the ground, they pulled out their switchblades and they start prying his teeth down. In New York, the crack epidemic began in the late 80s NYPD Lieutenant Mike Garrity. It was an extremely violent time. You had turf wars. You had people who just controlled a certain corner. If you set up to make a sale on that corner, there'd be a drive-by shooting. We were losing our youth. We were losing innocent bystanders to drive-bys. Every one of the index crimes went up. It was out of control back then. But arresting users and dealers individually does little to slow the onslaught. You know, it's never ending. Uh, it's just a constant flow. For every one or two guys you take down, there's others to replace them. The only way to stem the flow of narcotics is to find the organizations that import the drugs and dismantle them. To do this, the Department of Justice creates the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force. Known as C-13, the task force is made up of NYPD detectives and FBI agents. They know exactly who they're up against, according to Supervisory Special Agent Fernando Llanos. In New York in the early 90s, uh, the, the situation was that uh, you had Colombians uh, in control of the drug trade. The two main drug gangs are Colombia's Medellin and Cali cartels. When the cartels ship drugs into the country, they smuggle them in by packing them among valid cargo, according to U.S. Customs Special Agent Phil Spinelli. With containerized cargo, you can conceal the narcotics in just about any type of cargo that you ship into the United States. They've liquefied narcotics and tried to put it into bottles. They've uh, uh, disguised it uh, as dominoes. They've put it into cans of guava paste and cans of peaches where the peaches were completely sealed. And they ship it in through New York City, one of the busiest ports in the world. In the New York area, we receive approximately 
5,000 containers a day. Each of those containers probably have somewhere in the neighborhood of about 18, 20, maybe 30,000 pounds of cargo. So it's extremely difficult. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. When the drugs hit New York, they are distributed across the country. The task force is determined to shut off this supply of drugs and break the backs of the cartels. Our purpose in uh, the task force was to build cases, uh, try to monitor these individuals, try to infiltrate them, and take them down. To do so, Detective Apolito immerses himself undercover in the shadowy world of drug traffickers, and he needs help. The most productive cases uh, involve confidential informants because they know what's going on. They're already on the inside. Once the detective develops trust with an informant, doors begin to open. I had one particular confidential uh, informant that was extremely reliable. In December 1991, the informant tells Eppolito about a man named Eduardo. He says Eduardo deals in cloned cell phones and might be connected to the Medellin cartel. He knows the Colombian cartels desperately want to do business with the American Mafia. They felt uh, traditional organized crime was here a long time. They know all the ins and outs, all the tricks. They have all the contacts. And that's basically what they were looking for. This could be the opportunity eppolito has been looking for to get inside the cartel. He decides to go undercover posing as a member of the Mafia in an effort to orchestrate a large-scale drug purchase from the cartel. The detective asks the informant to set up a meeting with Eduardo and introduce him as Tony Romano, his undercover identity. The informant goes to Eduardo and tells him about Tony Romano. Eduardo seems interested in a Mafia connection and agrees to meet. But he warns the informant if it's a setup, there'll be hell to pay. Undercover work is among the most dangerous assignments an officer takes up. If he's identified as a cop, he and his informant will likely be killed. Every meeting is scripted so the undercover knows what to say and what to avoid. An undercover operation is a carefully orchestrated deal. Uh, we just don't send the undercover out there. He doesn't operate in a vacuum. Uh, what we do, we have pre-meets before we go out. We have tech plans. We go over them, things. We try to cover every scenario that possibly could happen. And when we decide to go out, the safety of the undercover is paramount. We have people that are assigned strictly to watch the undercover, provide security for them. You try to control the meet location. You're going to pick a location that you're somewhat familiar with. C-13 decides to have Eppolito meet Eduardo in a local bar. We set up outside, we surveilled, you know, them arriving and going in, but we also sent agents and detectives, you know, inside. The key is never appearing too anxious. It was best not to jump right into the drugs, because uh, a lot of times when you do that, they raise up on you and they think you're the cops or the feds, and they back off. So I figured I'd start off small, start off low, and try to do some cellular fraud uh, business with this guy. Eppolito suggests a deal for cloned cell phones, reprogrammed phones that use an unwitting customer's service for free. He says he needs them for his mob activities. And I also told him that I don't want to jump right into the drug aspect because I don't know who you are. You know, so let's do this, and if we both come out of it okay, you know, we can move on. So a little bit of psychology there. Eduardo agrees to clone the phones for a price. After the meet, Eppolito debriefs the task force. By now, intelligence agents have uncovered more details about the drug dealer. Eduardo was considered like a street dealer or a mule. He, uh, he wasn't well placed within any organization. He's a guy that would uh, broker, 
deals, try to hook you up with somebody, you know, stuff like that. He he definitely wasn't our main focus in this whole investigation. We wanted to use him as a stepping stone to go higher up or go up the ladder. Claiming he's satisfied with the clone phone deal, Eppolito takes the case to the next level. He sets up another deal with Eduardo, this time for drugs. The detective has to maintain his mobster image. You basically have to show credibility. You have to be able to convince the people uh, that you're who you say you are. In doing so, it means you have to walk the walk, talk the talk. Authorities need to play it cool. They don't want to order too much cocaine right away, which could tip Eduardo off. In fact, that's a red flag. So what we decided to do was just order a small amount. So one kilogram of cocaine is what we ordered from Eduardo. Eduardo comes through with a single kilo. A good sign he may be connected to a cartel. Undercover officers follow Eduardo after the deal. They need to determine if the man's really connected to a cartel. Someone who can lead them up the chain of command or just another small time dealer who cannot help further the investigation. Nobody knows, first of all, if in fact we really do have a narcotic smuggling organization. There seems to be hints of it. There seems to be smoke. And what we're trying to do is see if in fact there is a fire there. Investigators spot a man and a woman who might be associated with Eduardo going in and out of a house. Hopefully, authorities can ID the pair later. This sort of meticulous and time-consuming work is required to gather intelligence and build a case against the cartels who operate under a strictly enforced code of silence. The C-13 task force also checks the purity percentage of the cocaine Eduardo sold them. It was extremely high quality. It was in the high 90s, which was like telling you that it's you're basically into the source, which is what we needed. Pure cocaine means no middlemen have cut it down yet. It looks like Eduardo is a good lead into the cartels. At that point, we realized that we had somebody that could possibly take us to the types of individuals of drug traffickers that the task force was geared to target. It's the first milestone in what will be a long and dangerous investigation. In 1991, New York C-13 Task Force tries to infiltrate a Colombian drug cartel, beginning with a low-level broker named Eduardo. After one successful cocaine buy, Eduardo asks undercover detective Richard Eppolito to meet the drug dealers Eduardo represents. So he orchestrated a meet with uh, a female individual known as, a uh, street name was Monica. They would never give anybody their real name uh, for fear they would be identified. As with every meet, backup agents cover Eppolito. They recognize Monica as the woman seen at the house Eduardo entered after the first buy. When I was introduced to Monica, it just meant stepping up one, one extra step in a ladder. Eppolito must constantly maintain the charade. In character is Tony Romano, a member of the Mafia. He explains he has connections in customs and can move shipments through the ports. Agents spot a man watching the meat. They realize he's the other person seen at the house, Special Agent Fernando Llanos. Colombians, as sophisticated as they were, oftentimes would conduct counter surveillance. This was you know, a standard operating procedure for them. So we were wary of individuals that could be looking out to, you know, for law enforcement. It's a preliminary meeting. No real decisions are made. But Monica appears interested. She wants to meet again to discuss details with her partner, Willie. When she and Eduardo leave, backup tails them to ID Monica's car. Later, in an effort to ID her, the task force has a uniformed officer conduct a routine traffic stop on the car. The driver is the man who watched the meet in the restaurant. The officer gets IDs on the pair. 
The man is Gustavo Valencia. And Monica's real name is Rocio Londano. Investigators run the names and discover both are involved with Colombian cartels, the vicious worldwide leaders of the drug trade. With this information, the C-13 task force opens an official federal conspiracy case and brings in U.S. Customs. From the reports, Customs agent Phil Spinelli confirms Valencia's street name is Willie. Willie had been identified as being at least a distant cousin of Pablo Escobar, who was the head of the major cartel at that time. Escobar runs the Medellin cartel, the most violent gang in the history of Colombian drug trade. He offers bounties on the heads of Colombian police officers, maintaining power by killing whoever crosses him. Since Willie's related to Escobar, the C-13 investigation takes on new urgency. They might now be able to take the investigation all the way to the Colombian kingpin. Lieutenant Mike Garrity. Ideally, in any investigation, you take it from point A to point Z. And that's what we were trying to do. We were trying to get from the lowest level to the highest level. And once we met Willie with his connections, we figured we were right on target during the course of this investigation. While undercover, Eppolito is constantly under the threat of death. He can never slip out of character. Tony Romano, the role he is playing, supposedly knows how the ports work, but Eppolito doesn't. In order to maintain his disguise, customs agents must give the detective a crash course on international transportation. It was extremely important for, for Richie to be knowledgeable about the ports. You have to remember, what Richie is posing as this is a wise guy, a member of a mafia family. He's also purporting to have connections down at the piers so he can guarantee the safe passage of the narcotics through customs. The only way he can convince Willie and Monica of this is to have enough knowledge of the inner workings of the pier so when he explains to them how he intends to carry out the caper, it will be believable. It will be true. It will be accurate. Because the cartels are sophisticated enough to run their own background checks, the task force creates a full identity for the fictitious Tony Romano, complete with a long criminal record. Everyone working the case knows how important it is to hide Eppolito's true identity. They recall that in February 1985, decorated DEA Special Agent Enrique Camarena was ID'd as law enforcement by the Mexican drug gang he infiltrated. Gang members kidnapped him, tortured him, then stabbed him to death. The C-13 task force wires Eppolito to get incriminating conversations on tape. They are all aware that if Eppolito is discovered, it could be a death sentence. In previous meetings, no one has patted him down. But that could change. In this type of work, it's very easy to explain them finding a gun on you. I mean, that, that's part of doing business. You're going to have a gun on you. But it's extremely difficult to try to explain that little wire sticking up tape to your chest. Above all, Eppolito has to become his character fully to reduce suspicion. And I had to dress like the wise guys. I had to talk like the wise guys. Uh, I had to have a flashy car. I had to have the jewelry. Soon, Eppolito meets Willie. As he moves up the organization ladder, the criminals become more savvy. It gets tougher to fool them. We're talking about people doing a substantial period of time in jail if caught. Therefore, everybody has a sixth sense. Their very existence depends on whether or not they have a sixth sense or an antenna that goes up. And they're there to question uh, Richie. They're there to make some determination. Is he somebody who is reliable, dependable, and can they do business with him? There they are. The task force listens in and covers Eppolito. And uh, they're basically your buddies, though. They don't want to see you get hurt. So it's it's good feeling knowing that there are guys there to back up. The task force slowly makes its way toward the heart of the cartel, knowing that at any moment, a single mistake could be deadly. 
Undercover detective Richard Eppolito, posing as a mafioso named Tony Romano, meets with Colombian drug cartel members. He's backed up by other members of the C-13 task force, some of whom act as mafia bodyguards. Eppolito tells suspects Monica and Willie that if they can get the cocaine to the New York docks, he can move it past customs into his secure warehouse for distribution. Customs agent Phil Spinelli. That was very appealing to the Colombians because they need somebody to pick up these containers full of narcotics at the piers. After the meeting, undercover agents follow the suspects. They note an interesting aspect of Colombian drug traffickers, according to Supervisory Special Agent Fernando Llanos. They took a low-key approach. Colombians did not drive around in uh, Mercedes Benzes and, and Porsches and, and flashy, expensive vehicles. They didn't dress particularly in an expensive way. They didn't particularly wear exp they didn't wear expensive jewelry, a lot of gold and so forth. They made every effort to remain low-key, and we saw that with, with uh, Monica and Willie. From additional sources, investigators developed more intelligence on the couple. It was believed that they had loads in the past entrusted to them that had been lost. And therefore, they lost favor, they lost uh, money, and they were obligated to the cartels. When Willie and Monica lost the drugs, the cartels made one thing very clear. Make good on the debt or die. That pressure should help move the task force's case forward. Of course, the people that are indebted to the cartel are looking to get out of debt with the cartel and are willing to take more chances to hopefully make a bigger score to be able to get even. Through Monica and Willie, investigators expand the investigation and pierce the cartel's secret world, according to Detective Eppolito. One of the goals was to uh, establish enough probable cause to get court-ordered uh, wiretaps and further enhance the case gather intelligence, uh, basically know what the bad guy's gonna do before they actually do it. Because the couple discussed drug trafficking with Eppolito, investigators have no trouble getting warrants to tap their phones. The task force uses the taps to determine if the cartel believes Eppolito is who he says he is. They felt free talking on the phones. They would discuss a lot of their arrangements, uh, what they had in mind, what they wanted to do, uh, the big mafioso that they met, on tape, Monica and Willie tell their cartel contacts that Tony Romano is a safe bet. We could listen to their calls they were making to Colombia, discussing the meeting they just had with him, and you know we were able to gather insight that you would not be able to, to gather otherwise into what their thinking was. The cartel has taken the bait and is ready for the next step. They send another higher associate to meet with the mafioso. There's also a female that came into the picture named Magola. She was a uh, very attractive uh, Colombian national. Uh, she was the niece of uh, a notorious drug dealer out there who they used to refer to as uh, Ivan the Terrible. He was responsible for the deaths of approximately uh, 19 national police officers. The task force knows Ivan the Terrible specializes in killing cops. Usually in a torture chamber, he had built at his compound in Bogota, Colombia. Eppolito must continue playing his role and needs to convince Magola that he's a mafia wise guy or risk being killed. And he's the perfect cop to do it. He grew up with some, uh, quote, mob people. He knew how they acted. Uh, he had the looks, he knew the way to, to act, he knew the way to dress. And you give uh, Richie a little bit of leeway, you give him a script and he could play the role to a T, and he was absolutely excellent in playing his role. Apolito notices one of Magola's associates has a gun Are you nervous? and must decide whether to call for help from backup. He takes the risk and stays in character. He doesn't want to blow the case. Backup knows what to do if anyone gets suspicious of them. Is that possibly somebody is making us? 
what we would do is, is probably step a little bit further back from the set. So they would think that to a certain extent they are seeing ghosts, where in fact there were no ghosts. In the end, it appears Magola believes Tony Romano can provide a safe route for drug running. Slowly, the task force makes its way deeper into the cartel. We were piecemealed individuals. First we met Eduardo, then we met Monica, then we went, met Willie, then it was Margolis. They kept introducing different uh, people. The way it works, those people would report back to the people back in Colombia, and they'd say what's going on. It seems to be going well. But Eppolito can never let down his guard. He is in constant danger. If the cartel suspects anything, they could send assassins and hit Eppolito at any time, not just at a meeting. They could wait, get you at a later time, let you think everything's okay. Next time you show up, you get one in the back of the head. I feel very uppity, uh, very alert. Uh, it's just uh, natural adrenaline, I guess, that kicks in. Uh, there's a bit of excitement involved. It's challenging. Uh, it's dangerous. Any mistake could mean another murder of a dedicated law enforcement officer. New York investigators try to infiltrate Pablo Escobar's Medellin drug cartel and dismantle it. As the case builds, the C-13 task force puts more resources into it, including an office for undercover detective Richard Eppolito's mafia character. We just had an undercover office in uh, Floral Park, Queens. And uh, it was wired for both video and uh, audio to document meets and gather evidence. It's the best place for monitored meetings, according to Lieutenant Mike Garrity. We were able to bring the people there. We were able to record the conversations. We were able to videotape uh, every one of these conversations. When Monica and Willie show up to the office for a meeting, they're watched the entire time. FBI Special Agent Mary Setzer acts as Eppolito's receptionist. We met in the office approximately two or three times a month. My responsibilities were to answer the door when the subjects arrived, announce them to the undercover, and then usher them into the office. She's there for protection, but she's also part of the act. Richie frequently tried to ease the tension by making fake phone calls to me from the office during his meetings. He would pick up the telephone and say, make sure that order arrives tomorrow. Get that fax out. It's all done to convince the cartel members the detective is actually Tony Romano. You have to establish credibility with these people. If you say who you are somebody, uh, you have to show them, you have to prove it. So we set up this operation to bring them there and put them at ease. Uh, plus it served as a, a meeting place. It was out of the view of the public. They felt secure, they felt safe. It's a slow process as the task force orchestrates a complex fraud against wary adversaries. Supervisory Special Agent Fernando Llanos. These were savvy people, you know, these were people that were involved in drug trafficking for many years in Colombia and elsewhere outside of Colombia in furtherance of the cartel's uh, major worldwide distribution effort. Throughout the whole investigation, we were always concerned that, you know, there would be a slip up, uh, that something uh, inappropriate uh, would be said or perhaps that surveillances would be, would be made uh, that would give the whole thing up. If the cartel ever suspects anything, they would likely kill Eppolito and his informant. On rare days off, Eppolito needs a reason he can't meet Monica and Willie. He tells them he often goes to Atlantic City to tend to the mafia business there. Eventually, Monica and Willie ask to see the Atlantic City operation. Eppolito's got a problem. He has no real business in Atlantic City. The 
team scrambles to create an elaborate ruse that will trick the drug dealers. Took them all to Atlantic City. That's another credibility thing. They wanted to see where I spent my weekends, where I hung out. So we took them to the casinos. The uh, Jersey State Police were very instrumental on setting up uh, uh, the casinos where I could, you know, walk in like I was a big shot. Uh, we could comp them. We got them rooms. Uh, you know, we dined like kings uh, and queens. Backup is all around. The entire undercover operation is carefully scripted, and nothing is left to chance. The task force wants the cartels to see everything they need to see to believe Eppolito is a mafioso. They even send in an undercover officer to act as a mafia captain and ask the informant for a meeting with Eppolito. The informant talked to Richie. Richie walked away, but in clear view of the other participants. The other individual is prearranged, threw his arms around Richie, greeted him, kissed him on both cheeks, and he handed him an envelope with a wad of money. And Richie sent them on his way, walked back to the table, pulled out the wad of money in the envelope, leaped through it, put his back, and Richie complained that he's always working. Even in Atlantic City, he can't catch a break. And these people were totally impressed with this. But the cartel needs more convincing. They send an interrogator to meet with Abolito. His street name is Sammy and he specializes in finding undercover cops. Sammy was not somebody, he was a wild card that uh, was introduced to the investigation. He was, uh, you know, an enforcer, somebody that uh, apparently, you know, uh, was capable of, you know, determining whether somebody um, was, uh, you know, a law enforcement officer, obviously. The room is fully wired, and agents watch from an office in the hotel in touch with backup stationed near the room. They must protect Eppolito, but they can't move too soon. You have to make a decision basically uh, in a split second. And if you make the wrong decision in a case like this, let's say to move in, you just, you could blow maybe about a year's worth of investigation. Now, if you move too slow, you could lose an undercover. Sammy starts the interrogation. I didn't pat him at the door to see if he was armed or not, but you know, a lot of these guys are armed and you gotta be careful. And, uh, you know, I had to make sure I came up with the right answers because uh, if we had any inclination that I was uh, either a bad guy looking to rip him off or uh, law enforcement, I mean, God knows what might have happened. Eppolito knows backup is there, but it's still a tense situation. There's always a signal that's uh, set up between you and the backups in case something goes wrong or a code word. Uh, and, you know, you let loose with the signal or the code word, they just take the whole thing down. Several times, Sammy hints that he thinks Eppolito's trying to trick them. We were extremely close there. We could have got in there in a couple of seconds, but those couple of seconds could have meant life or death. Uh, so it is a gut-wrenching uh, situation. As Sammy continues to press Eppolito, agents fear that one wrong answer could destroy the entire investigation, and Detective Eppolito would be killed. Undercover Detective Richard Eppolito faces off against an interrogator from Pablo Escobar's drug cartel a man known only as Sammy. He demands details of Eppolito's past crimes to prove he really is a mafioso. Agents watch the meet, ready to send in backup. At some point during the interrogation process, I, I felt I had to put a stop to it before uh, either I said something that I couldn't back or the informant. And I basically stood up I told him, I says, listen, I says, do you really expect me to tell you everything I've done? Do you expect me to tell you the people I've killed, the people I've done drugs, dealt drugs with? I says, for all I know, you could be a cop, you could be an agent. I says, I told you what I'm going to tell you. you don't work the detective me? takes a risk in character as Tony Romano, demanding more respect. 
I says, here's my hand. Either you feel comfortable with me, or it's a pleasure meeting you, and I'll take my business elsewhere. The tension rises. And he got all upset. He walked off to the side, talking to them. There was some hollering and screaming in Spanish, of course, which I didn't understand. Sammy and the others might be planning something violent, but Eppolito can't back down now. You can't show that you're uh, intimidated or afraid of them. I mean, that's the worst thing. You got to come on uh, just as strong or even stronger than they do at times. Detective Mike Garrity is seconds away, but seconds might be too late. We were getting ready to move in, but Richie handled it excellent. He was able to get out of it. Watch both one one. All units stand down. Stand down. Everything's okay. Finally, Sammy decides Eppolito is the real thing. He came back, smiled, shook my hand, and said, we'll be doing business. Once again, the detective has conned the criminals. Customs agent Phil Spinelli. It's all part of being an undercover. It's all part of being able to act calmly under pressure. And Richie, of course, being the pro he is, handled it very well. Before the drug traffickers leave Atlantic City, Sammy decides to test the informant according to Supervisory Special Agent Fernando Llanos. All of the subjects asked uh, the source to, to go to one of their rooms to talk to him. And uh, fortunately, we had an adjacent room uh, and were able to listen in to, to the conversation. The informant is a civilian, not law enforcement, and might not hold up to the pressure of the interrogation. Agents watch as Sammy tries to get the informant to double-cross Tony Romano. He pushes hard. Got a little heated at times. Uh, the backup teams thought they were going to have to go crash through the door and rescue the informant and just basically take the case down at that point. It's a big case, but not worth a man's life. You have to take calculated risks, and this was another instance where we needed to do that. You know, uh, can we respond quickly enough? Can we get into the room if this man whips out a gun? you know, or a knife and puts it to our source's throat. The informant refuses to betray the powerful mafioso. He says, his people will kill me quicker than that. He says, I could never do anything to betray him or the family. And when he said that, they, they respected him. And uh, they saw he wasn't gonna betray me, so they felt, I guess they felt he had a certain amount of integrity and uh, he wouldn't be that much of a risk factor for them as well. And uh, they broke open a bottle of champagne in the room, and they celebrated. And... Another possible crisis averted. It could have been the end of the investigation, or the end, <laughs> the end of the informant if they had decided to kill him. It seems like endless meetings, but this level of caution is how the cartels grew so powerful. You're dealing with formidable adversaries. I mean, there was a lot of negotiations before we got down to the, um, the fine movements of getting the drugs from Columbia over to here. As the investigation deepens, the next step up the ladder is Hernando Sanchez Aneo, a high-level cartel member. He suggests going beyond a single shipment and opening a new drug pipeline into the U.S a marriage of the Colombian cartels and the American Mafia. We gave them the opportunity to move a product without law, uh, law enforcement interceding from the pier to one of our warehouses. So in effect, what we did, we provided one-stop shopping for this organization, and they loved it. The addition of Hernando means the C-13 task force is moving deeper into Escobar's cartel. It was a feather in our cap to get him involved in this particular thing, and more and more we, we, we knew we were getting closer and closer to the source. With a warrant, investigators tap Hernando's phones. To protect Eppolito, they route calls through a secure Atlantic City phone number to his New York home. During one call, Hernando asks Eppolito to come to Colombia with him to inspect a cocaine shipment. It's too dangerous for Eppolito to go. It would be like walking into the lion's den. 
and the task force would be unable to protect him. But if he backs out, the cartel may grow suspicious and kill him. Undercover detective Richard Eppolito was working to bring down the powerful Medellin drug cartel. Hernando Sanchez Aneo wants him to accompany him to Colombia to inspect a cocaine shipment. The detective must get out of the trip. It's too dangerous. His team could not protect him on foreign soil. Thinking quickly, he tells Hernando he can't leave his mob business unattended and hopes he doesn't suspect anything. I mean, one of two things could happen. They could just walk away from you and never have anything to do with you again. Or depending on how far you are into their group or organization, how much you do know, you, I mean, your life could be at risk. Apolito gets a break. Hernando falls for the story. The task force continues to follow the suspects to ID more associates. Investigators watch as Hernando meets with a man identified as Mauro Trujillo, a high-level cartel member who's been wanted by the DEA for narcotics trafficking and money laundering. Agents want to grab him, but they don't want to blow the current investigation, so they wait. As Eppolito gets deeper into the deadly cartel, the danger increases. There's a high risk factor. Uh, you know, some nights I didn't go home. Uh, if I did go home, I would have to uh, do it in such a way where I made sure I wasn't being followed. Finally, as the new year passes, Eppolito learns the shipment is on its way. But there's a change of plans. Instead of the cocaine, Hernando says they're sending a test load. Nine and a half tons of marijuana. In character is Tony Romano. The detective acts upset at the change. But it's a big load. And would be the evidence they need to bring the operation to a close. It was a heck of a test load. Normally, we hadn't seen anything like that. Test loads were like one or two kilos. See if it gets seized, goes onto the street, and let's see what happens. The task force can't let that amount of drugs on the street. When the load arrives at the New York docks, undercover investigators transport it directly to Eppolito's warehouse. The investigators need to check the container's contents. But there's a seal on its door to ensure no one has opened it. It's a common practice in international shipping. Agents need to find a way to get inside and keep the seal intact. U.S. Customs Agent Phil Spinelli. Uh, what they were able to do is to detach the door without breaking the seal. At first, it looks like a normal shipment of clothing. Stashed behind the shirts, marijuana. Literally tons of it. We recovered somewhere in the neighborhood of about 272 uh, cartons or crates containing 19,000 pounds of marijuana valued in excess of 21, 22 million dollars. They're definitely dealing with a major cartel. It's not easy to put together nine and a half tons of marijuana. These people had the resources to do all this. These are bad guys, uh, major violators. They, uh, you know, they plague this country with this stuff. And, uh, you know, they just needed to be taken down and bring a halt to their operation. For prosecution, the C-13 task force needs the suspects to complete the transaction and accept the shipment. Eppolito invites them to the warehouse. And, of course, there was video and uh, you know, surveillance equipment in place. We uh, had one of the, my so-called one of my workers, uh, come with a big bolt cutter and cut the seal on the back of the uh, container. And I handed them the seal. I said, here's a souvenir for you. And they could see that the load was sealed. It wasn't tampered with. It got here in one piece. And I uh, happened to have an Italian switchblade on me, by the way. I cut it open, and uh, they examined it, and they were happy. They saw it was the stuff they had sent over, and uh, they also wanted to take some back with them. 
But Eppolito can't let the drugs hit the street and uses the cartel's unplanned switch from cocaine to marijuana to his advantage. I said, uh, now you screwed me and, you know, this is basically how it's going to go. You're going to do what I tell you to do. I want those 5,000 kilos here. When I get my drugs, then you get your marijuana. The suspects panic. They are desperate to take control of the drugs. Shockingly desperate. Monica actually offered up her baby to me as a form of collateral and good trust. It's a stunning move no one expects. Fear comes across when you hear stories like that. The reason being is, is that if she's willing to give her child up to this unknown criminal figure, what would she have done to myself or any member of the investigative team if in fact she found out we were law enforcement or if in fact she found out that Richie in reality was an undercover police detective? It sends a couple of chills up your spine. Epolito stands firm. He will not release the marijuana until the cocaine he ordered comes through. The cartel members finally agree and plan to meet later. While C-13 plans arrests, Epolito faces increased pressure from angry cartel members. No, I can't do that. They've got pretty, pretty, uh, you know, heated. Uh, during these latter meetings because they kept pressuring him to release the drugs, you know, to release some of the marijuana so they can then, they could then sell it. On February 3rd, 1993, more than a year after the investigation began, the arrest plans are finalized. The task force moves in. They start with Willie and Monica at Apolito's office. By this time, the pair suspects nothing. <laughs> They were bewildered. They didn't know what was going on. Uh, you know, guys coming with shotguns, guns out, bulletproof vests on. Then, the man they knew as Tony Romano emerges. You know, I went out there to, uh, to speak to them and try to get them to cooperate. And I told them, you know who I am? I'm, I'm the police. And I guess they felt betrayed and that I had deceived them, which I did in the interest of justice. And uh, Willie actually looked at me with tears in his eyes and he says, uh, how could you do this to me? I said, well, Willie, I says, you come into this country, you bring this stuff, you destroy our people, our youth. I said, I'm a police officer, I'm a detective. He says, I'm here to uphold the law. He says, you broke the law. I said, you people are under arrest. And I was in, and I walked out of the room. Within 24 hours, C-13 arrests Hernando and six other co-conspirators. Magola is never found, having fled to Colombia. Eduardo, Monica, Willie, Hernando, Trujillo, and others are each charged with multiple counts of conspiracy to distribute narcotics. FBI Special Agent Mary Setzer. They all pled guilty. However, Mauro Trujillo, also known as Restrepo, fled the country and left for Colombia. The FBI is looking for information regarding the whereabouts of Mr. Trujillo. If anybody has that information, they can call the New York office of the FBI at 212 384-1000. More than a year of dangerous undercover work by the agents and officers of the C-13 task force helped cripple a drug cartel many thought was unstoppable. In the 1990s, a close-knit immigrant community was terrorized by one of its own. Those who turned to the police for help found themselves threatened or killed. Despite the risk, two men refused to back down. Their testimony could help end the killing if the FBI got close enough to uncover one man's deadly business.
many immigrants escaped the poverty of India to start new lives in the United States. Most dream of a better life for their families. One twisted the American dream into a nightmare. When people started turning up dead in New York's Indian community, law enforcement struggled to link fraud and murder to one powerful man. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. When the promise of the American dream was shattered by murder and corruption, the FBI provided hope to those people who had seen their lives and families torn apart. July 9th, 1995. Gas station attendant Kulwant Singh commuted to a gas station in the Bronx to work the late shift. Less than a year earlier, he had arrived in New York from a poor town in India, hoping to make a better life for himself and his family. That night, he disappeared. In October, the missing man's brother, Manmohan Singh, traveled to the U.S. to find him. He hadn't heard from his brother in months. It wasn't like him not to write or call. He began his search in Queens at the address of one of his brother's friends. His name was Satinderjit Singh. His family was from the same village as the missing attendants. Although this friend had the same last name, he was not related. Like many members of the Sikh religion, Satinderjit took the surname Singh, which means liar in the Punjabi language. Satinderjit said a missing persons report had been filed, but police had found no trace of his friend. He advised the new arrival to be careful who he talked to. Searching for the brother would be dangerous. Manmohan visited the gas station in the Bronx where his brother had worked. He spoke to an attendant, but the man was afraid to respond. His supervisor made it clear that no one should be asking questions. The employee was instructed to keep quiet. But Manmohan was persistent and convinced the attendant to meet him at a diner a few Look, days later. I can only be here for a few minutes. I know you're looking for him. The attendant said the missing brother had been accused of stealing from the gas station. And he was coming in to... Whether or not the allegations were true, they had made the station's owner angry. The attendant believed Manmohan's brother had been kidnapped and probably killed. By March of 1997, a year and a half after his brother's abduction, Manmohan took a job at a gas station in New York. He worked nights so he could spend his days secretly gathering information. He believed he knew who was responsible and was ready to go to the police. Okay, I need some oil. Then, on the night of March 16, 1997, he was silenced. Brooklyn North homicide detectives received a call from a customer who found the body.
They photographed the crime scene to record its condition, then gathered evidence. They collected two shell casings from a 9mm Ruger. Detectives found the register had been robbed, but were surprised that the thief had left some cash behind. Police also found no fingerprints. Detective Tony Brazada concluded that robbery was not the prime motive. We examined the scene and it looked like it was a typical gas station robbery at the beginning, but then examining the scene thoroughly, it seemed that it was more like an assassination or a this person was a target because he was shot very close range behind the head and he was on his knees. Detectives visited the Sikh temple where the funeral was being held. They knew this immigrant community was wary of outsiders, but hoped to find friends of the victim willing to talk. Satinjajit Singh stepped forward. He told detectives that he knew the slain man. Detectives explained that without cooperation, the killer would likely go free. Although he knew he was jeopardizing his own safety, he promised to meet with detectives and help them in any way he could. The following day, Satinderjit Singh came to the police station as promised. Yes, sir. He brought with him another witness, Savjit, who was also willing to talk. They told detectives they believed a wealthy and powerful Indian man named Dinza had ordered the murder of their friend, as well as the abduction of their friend's brother. Dinza was a corrupt and ruthless businessman who was well known in the Sikh community. Like many others, he had come to the U.S. from India in the mid-1980s with only a few dollars in his pocket. But his story was different than most. He had amassed an empire of more than 50 gas stations in and around New York City. And, uh, which was common with all the... The witnesses knew several of Dinza's employees and explained to Detective Teddy Braun that the millionaire would stop at nothing to protect his business. This whole thing was fear. He used the fear tactic that he had this community petrified of him. I mean, to the point where he could walk in and do something in front of hundreds of people and no one's gonna say nothing. Police also learned that Dinza was no stranger to crime. His record included convictions for felony assault, kidnapping, robbery, gas pump fraud, and weapons possession. He'd serve time, but always managed to get back on the street to run his mafia-style operation. Within the Sikh community, Dinza was known as the Indian Godfather. The witnesses said Dinza's empire was a family affair, with Dinza's brother a member of the inner circle and an enforcer for the organization. Sarvjit had seen for himself just how ruthless the brother could be. In 1993, outside a Queen's restaurant, the informant witnessed Dinza's brother arguing with a man. The disagreement ended with Dinza's brother shooting him in close range. Sarvjit rushed to the victim's side, but it was too late. Dinza's brother was spirited out of the country to India. He was never captured. The witnesses now told the detectives that they'd heard the brother would soon be returning to America. They were risking their lives talking to police, but they couldn't let the violence continue. Yes, sir. Both promised to report when Dinza's brother arrived. He's going to be coming back to the United States because Dinza's company was getting so big that Dinza needed another hand. And Dinza was the type of person where he'd rather have family hands-on than outsiders when it came to his money. True to their word, in May of 1997, the witnesses told police that Dinza's brother was back in New York. Police set up outside the warehouse of Dinza's headquarters in Brooklyn, waiting for his brother to arrive. Both witnesses were present to assist police with identifying the murder suspect.
We have a possible target. Stand by. Armed with an arrest warrant, police surrounded the building and cordoned off all entrances, including the back doors of the warehouse. From the surveillance van, Satinderjit confirmed that it was Dinza's brother heading for the front door. We have a target entering the building. Moments later, officers reported that shots were fired inside the building. They held their posts, waiting for orders. Ready? We're going in. Let's go. Officers forcibly entered the front of the building. Three men raced out the back door into the hands of police. The men were Dinza's brother, his cousin, and his nephew. All three were arrested. Quickly securing a search warrant, police confiscated firearms. Seven pistols, a shotgun, and a silenced machine gun. As they loaded the contraband into a police car, Dinza himself arrived at the scene. He protested the seizure, claiming that the building and guns were his property. But the guns were illegal. Police arrested him on weapons possession charges. They took him to the 112th precinct, where Dinza was booked and fingerprinted. Police pressured him to cooperate. They had two witnesses who would testify against him and his brother for murder. Insisting he was innocent, he refused to talk. Dinza was held in the Brooklyn Correctional Facility awaiting a bail hearing. But incarceration did not prevent the murder suspect from running his empire. Speaking in Punjabi so guards couldn't understand him, he coerced employees and acquaintances to find out who dared to testify against him and his brother. Besides witness statements, police had little other evidence. Dinza would be out on bail shortly. If he discovered the identity of the witnesses, they might not testify. Then, the murder and weapons charges against the brothers would have to be dropped. In May 1997, New York City police arrested two East Indian brothers who had been terrorizing their immigrant community for years. Except for the statements of two witnesses, investigators had little evidence against them but they believed that Dinza was the ringleader and that he had ordered two murders and a kidnapping. Dinza had posted bail on May 4, 1997, just days after his arrest. But his brother remained held on a murder charge in New York City's Rikers Island prison. Through informants, Dinza had learned the identity of the two witnesses against him. If they continued to cooperate with the police, he, his brother, and his multi-million dollar gas station empire would be in jeopardy. Okay, tell me a little more. One of the witnesses, Satinderjit Singh, was close with several employees of the suspected murderer. He knew a great deal about how Dinza ran his $60 million gas station chain. He said that Dinza rigged pumps, skimmed profits, and ordered people abducted if they talked. Detectives believe the information was compelling enough to seek an indictment. In early June of 1997, investigators met with the assistant U.S. attorney to explore Dinza's illegal activities. NYPD detective Teddy Braun explained how Dinza's pump rigging scheme worked. Dinza owned like 53 gas stations, and uh, he had this unique skimming system. 
and what it did was it regulated the amount of gas that was pumped into a consumer's vehicle. So if you would have went in an extra $10 worth of gas, he'd be able to set up that machine where it can give you 80%, 90%, whatever percent that he wanted to give you, and the rest would be saved. Assistant U.S. Attorney Ben Campbell learned that not only was Dinza's empire corrupt, it was extensive. The NYPD informed us that Dinsa um, had, among other things, an organization built around um, uh, pump fraud, basically ripping off customers at his gasoline stations throughout the New York and New Jersey area, by which he generated millions of dollars in income, that he protected that pump fraud activity through a pattern of violent uh, crime, including murder. On June 18th, just as the federal investigation was beginning, witness Satinjajit Singh was shot to death in Queens. It was the day before Dinza's brother, suspected of murder, was scheduled to attend a hearing. At the crime scene, a neighbor told police he had witnessed the crime. He had been outside at the top of his stoop when the shooting took place. Since his apartment lacked air conditioning, he was watching a Mets game on his front porch. He was distracted by what appeared to be a traffic dispute. The neighbor described the shooter as a tall African-American male, but he never saw his face. The slain man's cousin was sitting beside his relative in the car when he was killed. The cousin told police it had all happened so fast. He was too shaken to remember any details. Forensic technicians photographed the scene. They collected shells that had been fired from a 9mm handgun. No other physical evidence was found. Nothing to prove that Dinza was responsible. Investigators believe that Dinza would continue to use any means necessary to protect his millions. They needed some way to stop him. NYPD detectives turned to Assistant U.S. Attorney Ben Campbell for guidance he would refocus the investigation to take advantage of the federal RICO statute, the Racketeering Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act, a law used to prosecute organized crime. This looked like had all the hallmarks of a racketeering prosecution. It had um, an organization with uh, leadership, it had racketeering activity which generated income, and it had a pattern of criminal activity which spanned several years, almost a decade. This would widen the scope of the investigation considerably. The assistant U.S. attorney called on the FBI for help. Special agent in charge Kevin Donovan from the FBI's New York field office worked the case. The FBI was planning on conducting a traditional organized crime investigation that would focus on uh, development of cooperating witnesses, use of cooperating witnesses, review of records, and search warrants to focus on the multiple acts of violence and the multiple acts of fraud. That would not be easy. In order to develop new witnesses, agents would have to ensure the safety of those who came forward. As long as Dinza Singh was able to intimidate witnesses through violence, threats of violence and homicides, our investigation would be very limited. We needed to make sure that no other individuals who would cooperate with us would be hurt by News of the most recent killing spread quickly through the Sikh community. The other witness, Sarvjit, and his family prepared to leave town. Investigators pleaded with him to allow the FBI to place him under protective custody. But he insisted on taking his wife and two small children away from New York. Despite investigators' best efforts, Dinza had intimidated another witness. 
to the Sikh community, the police and the FBI seemed powerless to protect them. In the summer of 1997, the FBI was on the trail of a violent businessman named Dinza. Investigators believed he had already killed two men, kidnapped a third, and scared another out of New York. They needed an informant close to Dinza to get enough evidence to arrest him. I will get back to you. But special agent in charge Kevin Donovan found that Dinza was well protected. The major hurdle that the FBI and the New York City Police Department had to overcome was an inability to develop cooperating witnesses and informants early on due to language difficulties and due to the fact that most of the individuals who worked at City Gas Corporation were not willing to come forward because of Dinza Singh's threats of violence and his acts of violence that were well known throughout the community. Dinza now threatened the life of another member of the Sikh community. Balwan Singh was close friends with the witness who had fled the city with his family. The man was terrified. Dinza had come after him to find the one remaining witness. He remained holed up in his apartment with his wife and daughter for three days before he finally called police. He reached the Queen's Homicide this Unit, morning, which was investigating the murder of Satinderjit Singh, a witness and, uh, against Dinza. Um, Balwan told police that he had attended the slain man's funeral. There he was approached by one of Dinza's men. He asked Balwan where the other witness was hiding. Dinza wanted to discuss the witness's testimony face to face. Balwant refused to tell him anything. But now he feared for his own life. Police told him that they would discuss the possibility of providing him and his family with protective custody. Two detectives would be right over. Since the funeral, he had been ignoring the demands of the construction company he owned. Mr. Singh, please. Hello? Yes, Mr. Singh. Yeah. Here at the when the company called, he agreed to run an urgent errand. He left his frightened family, promising he'd return as soon as he could. He knew Dinza's reputation. It would be difficult to avoid him for very long. Just minutes after pulling out, the man noticed a sedan that seemed to be following him. It was Dinza. Balwant didn't want to take any chances, so he returned home. Dinza sped away. As detectives headed for Balwant's apartment, they received a page. It was a coded message from their supervisor, asking them to call in immediately. Lacking a cell phone, they stopped to make the urgent call. While the detective was on the phone, he noticed an Indian man watching him closely from a car. He decided to investigate. The 
detectives asked the driver for his license and registration. It was Dinza. Mind stepping at, sir? When detectives asked to search his car, he agreed. Inside, they found some gas receipts. In the trunk, detectives also found electronic gauges for gas pumps. Dinza possessed nothing that was illegal. Since there was no outstanding warrant for his arrest, detectives let him go. The detectives were called away on an emergency. They never made it to the informant's home that day. The next morning, the man's frightened wife called police. Her husband had taken refuge in a friend's gas station. He waited anxiously for them to arrive and was relieved to see them pull up. His wife and daughter were picked up moments later. That evening, the family was taken to an undisclosed hotel outside of New York. The family would hide there under police protection until Dinza could be arrested. Detectives informed Balwant that they had run into Dinza near his neighborhood. They asked if he could verify the man's identity from a photo. Balwant identified him instantly. Investigators had one more witness in their case against the deadly businessman, but they still lacked sufficient evidence to make an arrest. In July of 1997, FBI agents and NYPD detectives believed gas station mogul Dinza was the man behind the murders of two Indian immigrants and the disappearance of a third. Investigators had little evidence to prove their theory, and Dinza's intimidation had silenced most witnesses. But a few among the community were tired of living in fear. At the end of July, Brooklyn North homicide detective Teddy Braun interviewed a source close to Dinza. During the interview with the confidential informant, my partner Tony Rosada came across a name Marvin, who was linked as Dinza Singh's strong arm. The man's full name was Marvin Dodson. He was a 35-year-old African-American male. Detectives discovered that he had an arrest record for illegal firearms. Any of these men look familiar? They showed a photo lineup to the cousin men? of the slain witness who was in the car when the shooting occurred. Do you recognize any of these men? He immediately identified Dodson as the gunman. Detective Anthony Brazada now began searching for Marvin Dodson. Okay. My partner and myself put together a list of uh, various locations, like about six or eight locations where he hung out, uh, his residence, his relatives. On July 4th, 1997, police cornered Dodson in a Queens neighborhood. They arrested him and took him to the station. Stop. Dodson agreed to testify against Dinza in return for a lighter sentence. On Sunday morning, July 6th, 1997, Dodson and his attorney met with Queens homicide detectives, the assistant U.S. attorney, and the FBI. Dodson confessed that he had been hired by Dinza for the murder. Dodson said the plan to kill one of the witnesses began on May 18, 1997. At the time, Dinza had just been released on bail.
Dodson would be the trigger man, hired to kill the witness scheduled to testify against Dinza and his brother. First, they picked up the murder weapon, a 9mm Ruger. The same caliber of shell casings were later collected at the crime scene. Dodson told investigators that Dinza then ordered him to hire a driver for the hit. Go ahead and tell us the story. Dinza's next move was to conduct surveillance of the witnesses. Assistant U.S. Attorney Ben Campbell recalls that Dinza provided Dodson with all the information he'd need to get to Satinderjit Singh. He gave Mr. Dodson the address where Satinderjit Singh lived, the license plate number to his vehicle, and instructed um, Mr. Dodson to watch Satinderjit Singh and kill him at the first opportunity. What do you do with the gun? On June 18, 1997, Dodson received a phone call from Dinza. His boss told him that the witness needed to be dead before nightfall. Dinza's brother's hearing was the following day. The hit would send a message to everyone who considered testifying. Dodson said that he and his driver, Walter Jazz Samuels, met Dinza at one of his gas stations. Dinza provided them with a white van. They watched Satinderjit's house until he came out. He was with his cousin. a disturbance so that Satinderjit would pull over and allow the van to pass. When he did, the van blocked him from moving. Dodson shot the unarmed man eight times at close range. The hitman's description of the events of that day corroborated a neighbor's statement to police. Dotson also told investigators that after the killing, he had returned the white van to Dinza's garage on Roosevelt Avenue. He gave the gun back to Dinza, who paid him and the driver $20,000 for the hit. On July 6, 1997, police approached the Brooklyn home of Walter Jazz Samuels, the man who Dotson claimed had driven the van. Samuels. They arrested him without incident. Police learned that Samuels had a record of previous arrests. With Samuels in custody, investigators turned their attention to Dinza. The U.S. Attorney's Office believed agents and detectives now had enough evidence to indict Dinza on federal racketeering charges. Special agent in charge Kevin Donovan recalls that agents dispersed across the city to find him. FBI agents and New York City Police Department detectives initiated surveillances at several city gas corporation gas stations in which Dinza Singh was known to frequent. At 5 p.m. on July 7, 1997, FBI agents and NYPD detectives followed Dinza to his Foster Avenue gas station. When he arrived, they arrested him for murder, kidnapping, pump fraud, and obstruction of justice in aid of a corrupt organization. The entire case hinged on the testimony of Dinza's hitman, Marvin Dodson. But because Dodson was a murderer, the U.S. attorney still needed to substantiate his story with other evidence or witness testimony. They hoped that testimony would come from Walter Jazz Samuels, the man who Dodson fingered as his accomplice in the murder of Satinderjit Singh. Samuels now told investigators he was not in the van at the time of the shooting. 
He claimed he was at a nearby restaurant. His story checked out. Investigators believe Samuels knew who drove Dodson on the day of the killing. But he wasn't talking, and neither was Dodson. Investigators needed something else to corroborate Dodson's story. They secured a search warrant for Dinza's Roosevelt Avenue gas station, the place where Dodson had returned the white van after the murder. You got any they searched the entire premises, here. but found little other than stolen license plates. They believe they were probably used on getaway cars during the commission of crimes. But once bags. again, they had no proof. They found nothing that could corroborate Dodson's story or connect Dinza to the murder. As the FBI and police continued to pursue evidence, Dinza was behind bars once again, pending a July 14th bail hearing. Investigators hoped Dinza's incarceration would encourage witnesses to come forward. It did not. As before, Dinza continued to rule with an iron hand. Unfortunately, as a result of Dinza Singh's ability to make telephone calls from jail, he was able to continue to run his corporation and his business and to focus on threatening additional individuals who might have come forward to cooperate with the FBI and the New York City Police Department. For the second time in three months, authorities held the suspected murderer behind bars. They hoped it would be his final arrest. But the millionaire hired a high-priced defense team, and the prosecution's entire case still hinged on the testimony of a confessed killer. In July of 1997, a man named Dinza had been arrested on federal racketeering charges that included murder and kidnapping to protect his corrupt business empire. It was his second arrest in three months. As he had before, Dinza directed his business and even threatened potential witnesses from a prison telephone. But this time, investigators were listening. Assistant U.S. Attorney Ben Campbell was not going to let Dinza slip through his hands again. They had to keep him behind bars. First, um, his conversation was in Punjabi, which is a very um, unique dialect and uh, it took us some time before we could find a Punjabi translator to translate those telephone calls. Secondly, he was not um, very overt in his conversation, so he's somewhat cryptic in his um, conversation with his colleagues. The translations opened a rare view into just how tightly Dinza held the reins to his empire. Dinza attracted customers to his rigged pumps by advertising the lowest gas prices in New York but his pumps provided less than a gallon for the price. He was issuing routine instructions to the members of his office, telling them to um, change the price of gasoline at his various stations, to continue to order supplies for his company. In addition, um, he also gave them instructions about um, things to communicate to their attorneys and steps to be taken in order to try and get him out on bail. As Campbell raced to find evidence to keep Dinza from making bail, police processed the suspect's car. They found business cards that linked Dinza to his hitman, Marvin Dodson, and Dodson's operative, Walter Jazz Samuels. Police also recovered a list of names and addresses that appeared to be a hit list. The list included the home address of Savjit Singh, a federal witness who had fled the city with his family. Balwant Singh, who was under protective custody, had also made the list. Seven more men with Punjabi names appeared as well. It was just what investigators needed to keep Dinza from making bail. While they did not know whether these men were dead or alive, they knew who might. Agents asked Walter Samuels about the list, hoping it would prompt his memory. He finally opened up. He said that Dinza had planned to kill those nine men. Two of them, Balwant and Sarvjit, were federal witnesses. The other seven were Balwant's family members. 
they were all still alive. Once again, agents would need to corroborate the story. Confined in the room next door, Marvin Dodson and his lawyer waited to be questioned. Dodson confirmed Samuel's story and added something else. He said that on July 3rd, just days before Dinza's most recent arrest, Dinza had purchased two used police cruisers as part of the assassination plan. Dodson had copies of the titles, which his lawyer now offered to the agent as proof. Mr. Dinza's plan was for Mr. Dodson and Mr. Samuels to pose as law enforcement officers and to stop Mr. to stop Balwant Singh um, on the street along with members of his family and uh, kidnap them and bring them to Mr. Dinza at an undisclosed location. You're going to try to cram all these people Feeling yeah. the pressure and hoping to cut a deal, Samuels now told investigators the name of the man who drove the white van during the murder. His name was Evans Alonzo Powell. Because Powell had no arrest record, Dodson wanted to protect him. He had threatened Samuels not to give him up. On July 19, 1997, police arrested Powell on a Brooklyn street. He agreed to cooperate. Powell admitted that he had driven the van for the murder in Queens. Investigators finally had their corroborating witness. Powell also talked about another crime. Tell us more about where... Dinza had ordered the murder of the Indian man who had traveled to America to search for his missing brother. Powell was present when Dodson killed the attendant at the Brooklyn gas station on the night of March 16, 1997. Detective Tony Brizada remembers Dodson's confession. He admitted uh, shooting him twice in the head, had him, kneel, had him kneeling down. And he said he got, he got paid by Singh for doing this. He, that Singh wanted this person uh, killed. He didn't give him a reason, but he just wanted him killed. Dinza had paid Dodson just $4,000 for taking the man's life. Dodson stole money to pay Powell for being the lookout. Special agent in charge, Kevin Donovan, continued to gather evidence about Dinza's pump rigging activities. The FBI and the New York City Police Department executed a search warrant at the Foster Avenue City Gas gas station. The focus of our search was to identify and obtain evidence of the pump rigging scheme. As a result of a, the excavation of the area around the pump, electronic devices were located in a box that was used to control the pump rigging scheme. Investigators determined that Dinza manipulated the flow of gasoline to customers' cars through devices controlled by remote, wired to the pumps and buried underground. The systems could be turned on or off at will. Detective Teddy Braun explains that Dinza taught many of his employees when to turn them on and off. You were taught how to work on remote. And what would happen would be if a person, look, for instance, if a person came in for a gallon of gas for their lawnmower, what would happen was the gas attendant would hit a, a remote in his pocket, which was just like a car alarm remote. And what that would do, it would shut off the skimming system. And the system would go right up to perfect so that when the gas attendant pumped a, a gallon worth of gas in a, in a container, it was perfect. So there would be no question. In late July of 1997, the FBI conducted an exhaustive search of Dinza's Brooklyn Warehouse headquarters. There they found his double books. We discovered documents reflecting bribery payments to a corrupt Department of Consumer Affairs inspector. In addition, we also estimate um, the total value of Mr. Dinza's um, pump fraud activities in the neighborhood of $40 million over 10 years. By September of 1998, the body of the man abducted from a gas station in the Bronx in 1995 was still missing. But agents had a hunch. Based on New York City construction records at the time of his disappearance, 
agents suspected that Dinza had buried the attendant underneath one of his gas stations. It was determined that the most likely gas station that was under construction at that time was a gas station located at Farragut and Flatbush Avenue. On September 16, 1998, investigators arrived at the station with heavy equipment. They employed ground-penetrating radar to help locate the body beneath the earth. They selected two separate sites where they believed the man might be buried. The construction crew removed slabs of concrete, and the FBI, the New York City Police Department, examined these two sites that were located by the ground-penetrating radar. Investigators never found the man's body. Though this news was disappointing, investigators were having better luck with other leads. Assistant U.S. Attorney Ben Campbell subpoenaed Dinza's cell phone records. They placed Dinza at the time and place of Satinderjit Singh's murder. Prosecutors were well armed when Dinza's trial began in Brooklyn Federal District Court. Court. They hoped to convict him on 29 counts, including capital murder. murder. Savjit Singh, who assisted the investigation despite death threats, testified against the man accused of killing his friends. On March 2, 1999, after two and a half days of deliberations, the jury found Dinza guilty of 21 of the 29 counts. They included murder, attempted murder, and fraud. Dinza was acquitted in the kidnapping of the man whose body was never found. On October 5, 1999, Dinza received eight life sentences without possibility of parole. He escaped the death penalty. Later that month, the same judge sentenced Dinza's hitmen for their roles in the murders. For assisting in the conviction of Dinza, their sentences were considerably lighter. Powell received 10 years, Samuels 12, and Dotson 18. But it was the conviction of Dinza that was most satisfying to prosecutors. Prosecution of Mr. Dinsa was a very, sort of personally for me, a very rewarding experience. We were able to step into a community that frequently does not turn to law enforcement for assistance and to render some significant help to them in order to remove an individual who was, um, I mean, for lack of a better term, um, a plague on that community. Like many immigrants before him, Dinsa arrived a poor man and was embraced by a community of compatriots but he repaid their kindness with swindles and murder. For his greed and brutality, he will never be free again.